Grace, is it live yet? Yep, folks okay. are in. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. I'm sure a few more people will roll in. Um, or also, if you're joining us on YouTube or any of our streaming, thank you. Um, my name is Danica. I am one of the national co-directors at Code Pink. And thank you for joining today for this webinar, uh, the DNC in Chicago, the whole world is watching. Um, Chicago hosted the Democratic National Convention in 1968 in the wake of the Vietnam War and protests against U.S. imperialism. And this year, Chicago will host the DNC again amid the growing movement for Palestine as the United States continues its support for Israel. Um, I'm really excited. I have three great uh, panelists here today to have a little discussion um, about the DNC, what it means, the parallels, and how to take this movement um, and build the build the movement um, at, with this as a jumping off point. Um, three people I really respect and admire. We have Bill Ayers, a distinguished professor of education and a retired senior university scholar at the University of Illinois Chicago. He is an engaged scholar and a peace and social justice activist who's written extensively about social justice, freedom, democracy, education, and the cultural context of schooling. And Bill was actually present at the March on the DNC in 1968 in Chicago. We have Medea Benjamin, the co-founder of Code Pink. She's also the co-founder of the Human Rights Group's Global Exchange, Peace in Ukraine Coalition, Unfreeze Afghanistan, and Asere. Um, Medea has protested at DNCs and RNCs um, as a part of Code Pink demonstration over Code Pink demonstrations over the years. And Eleanor Stein is a climate justice advocate and activist. She teaches law of climate change and human rights at the state of uh, the State University of New York and has taught climate change law since 2005. Um, and Eleanor is also very, very involved, and I'm sure we'll talk a bit more about it um, in the mass movement against the Vietnam War in the 60s and 70s. Um, and just to give people sort of a brief overview of what we have in the works um, as the DNC approaches in just, I think, two and a half weeks or three weeks. Um, Code Pink is part of the March on the DNC Coalition, which is um, a huge cohort of organizations. Um, you could look on the March on the DNC website to see the full list, but it's us and primarily a lot of uh, Palestinian groups that are based here in Chicago to march on the DNC with our largest demand uh, being about Palestine and stopping U.S. arms to Israel. Um, we are marching on the DNC August 19th and 22nd, so the first and last days of the DNC. And if you go to codepink.org forward slash Chicago, you will find all of the information that you need to join us um, both those days and for our fun Code Pink disruptions the other days as well. Uh, we're actually starting activities on the 18th with, with um, a separate march and then another disruption. So we have a jam-packed week of activities, um, but I do want to talk to these three about uh, Democratic National Conventions in general and also um, the movements um, that have uh, shown up on their doorstep over the years. So um, this will be a discussion. Um, we'll have about 40-ish minutes, and then I'm hoping we can have time at the end for questions. So please feel free, if you're a participant in the, on the Zoom function, to use the Q&A function throughout the whole thing. Um, if they're coming up, please type them in the Q&A, um, and we'll try and get to them at the end. Um, but until then, we'll just discuss among the three of us. I'll have questions, and then we can just riff off each other. But... I'm going to start with Medea because I was just with Medea in Milwaukee to protest the Republican National Convention. Um, and Medea, a lot has changed since then. <laughs> like things changed right before the RNC and then right after the RNC, right after the RNC um, and even last night. So what do you make of the current escalations in the war in Gaza as just last night Hamas's political leader was assassinated um, and what do you think about it in the context of what the movement is doing in the U.S. and it's still, you know, resisting Israel's genocide um, and we're still protesting the DNC? So what do you make of the changes in the escalation and then within the Democratic Party itself? Well, it's amazing, as you say, so much changes. We don't know what's happening day to day these days. I mean, going to the RNC, who would have known that there would be an assassination attempt against Trump? 
I have no idea if that kept some people away, but it seems like there was not a lot of mobilizing for the RNC to begin with, right, Danica? I mean, you were closer to that than I was. Yeah, there was the one march that had a pretty large coalition, but day of it felt, you know, I'm glad we had a safe march with everyone, but it was rather small. Um, and we we're sort of the only group there the other days doing other demonstrations. It was quite shocking. I mean, the march itself, I don't think was more than 2000 people, which is amazing that it was so small. And then to see the streets outside the convention center, I mean, full of people going to the convention center, but devoid of protesters. It was just surreal almost because you think of all the people in this country that hate Donald Trump and say that if he wins, it will be the end of democracy and fascism in this country. And it will be, you know, uh, people wanting those with the privilege of having a passport trying to decide where they're going to go live. I mean, it's uh, the the amount of fear about a Donald Trump victory is so huge. And yet, where were those people? So uh, I was very stunned by the lack of uh, protests on the streets during the RNC. Now, I expect there to be a lot more at the DNC because it's in Chicago, which is a bigger city than Milwaukee. It's a city with a lot of activists. And um, the the uh, Biden administration is the administration that's been responsible for uh, supporting the genocide in Gaza. So I think there is a lot of anger. Now, what has changed now that Biden is not going to be the uh, candidate? Um, well, I think um, that to me, this is perhaps even more reason to be there and in the streets because I think of the need right now to be the counterweight to what I see every day in the halls of Congress, um, which are people from APAC. Yesterday, it was flooded with groups from the organization called Christians United for Israel. They were all over the place, and their push was uh, to sanction Iran even further. Of course, they had planned that even before uh, this new development that just happened with the killing of the political leader of Hamas, Ismail Haniya, uh, in Iran. Now, the importance of that is tremendous. Understand that Israel has been trying to drag the U.S. into a war with Iran for a long time. And killing this Hamas leader when he was there for the inauguration of the new president of Iran, somebody who campaigned on a platform of better relations with the West couldn't be a more dramatic uh, uh, new level of danger in what is going to happen in this region with the new Iranian president feeling the pressure to do something dramatic against Israel. Uh, and uh, this affects our situation here in the United States and the convention and the position of, of Kamala Harris, because I think she's getting even more pressure now to be tough uh, on the uh, not only Hamas, but all of the groups in the region that have been supporting the Palestinians. And that's why I feel that it's more important than ever to come out. Um, now, you know, we can talk about the uncommitted movement that uh, tried to put pressure on the Biden administration to do something about the administration's policies on Israel uh, and how important that movement has been. Well, that movement is very divided right now around Kamala Harris. And I think broader than that movement, many people around the country for whom the issue of the genocide in Gaza is a very important issue, are really in a state of uh, perhaps confusion about what to do. Because you could say on the one hand um, that Kamala Harris has been part of this administration. She certainly hasn't resigned as a result of saying, you know, this is a horrific policy. I can't stand it. I'm, I'm out of here. Uh, on the contrary, she's been very much a part of this. And when she was a senator, she was uh, a rock solid supporter of Israel, unconditional military support for Israel. 
Um, on the other hand, uh, I think people are desperately looking for some light between her and Biden to feel better about voting for her because of their fear of Trump. And so they're looking at things like the fact that she came out before Biden did calling for a ceasefire. In fact, it was back in March. Uh, that was five months into the genocide, but still before Biden, she has expressed more sympathy towards the plight of the people in Gaza than Biden has. She refused to preside over Netanyahu's visit to Congress, yet she met with him separately, yet she did afterwards uh, talk about the horrific conditions for people in Gaza and that she will not be silent. Um, so people are looking and putting pressure on the Harris campaign is the most, perhaps the most important thing that people can do right now. And that's why this is a long answer to your question, Danica, about why it's so important to be at the DNC, because we have to be there very loud and clear as this voice of morality, this voice of conscience, this voice of uh, let's respect US law and international law, and this voice of saying, let's not allow this to go into an even more dramatic, more dangerous regional war right now. We must be on the streets in large numbers, both outside and inside, protesting this administration, including Kamala Harris, uh, 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 participation in this genocide. Thanks, Medea. Um, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I could just ask a question to Medea or say, make a little comment and ask a question. First of all, deep, deep admiration and respect for Code Pink and what you've been able to do. Your militancy is unbelievable, but I, but, but, and, and, and really necessary. And, and so I, I'm I'm heeding the call, and I'll be in the streets with you. Um, but but I want to take a quick step back and think about what our north star is, what it is we're trying to accomplish, and what it is, and who our audience is. You know, I think sometimes people feel that our audience is the political class itself, and I think the title of this webinar says it all. The whole world is watching. That's the audience. The audience is masses of people who can be convinced that the narrative about a small besieged democratic Israel, you know, fighting for its life against, uh, you know, the barbarians is just wrong. Or the idea that Zionism is somehow a gentle, you know, peaceful thing. I think one of the things we have to note, and I credit Code Pink and I credit Jewish Voice for Peace and all the Palestinian organizations, the Palestinian people, but including uh, students for Justice in Palestine. But we have changed the narrative in the last nine months about Israel and about the U.S. role in the Middle East. And I think all credit to the people who did the encampments, the people who rose up. Now, in order to come to something like the RNC, you have to believe it's going to make a difference. You have to think, not only do I hate Trump, but I actually think that I will accomplish something. So I think it's very important for us to say that this is part of a larger effort to change the narrative and to point to the fact that the U.S. is a belligerent, um, warmongering uh, force in the Middle East and that Israel would not exist. It's, it's an illegal, immoral, um, out-of-control government. And frankly, you pointed in the beginning to the, to the murder of this um, high official. He was the chief negotiator. So talk about, you know, here we are, most of us who are of any goodwill at all, wishing for, hoping for, striving for a ceasefire, the main negotiator, you negotiate in one, one day, with him one day and you kill him the next day. It's just extraordinary. And the fact that the US has had a non-response to that is extraordinary. So I think we need to be in the streets, but I think we should be saying to ourselves, what is it we're trying to accomplish? I want us to accomplish a much broader audience for an understanding of what Israel is in reality and what the U.S. role is in the Middle East as a war-making power. Thank can you. I, can I I love it. on that note? Uh, yeah, I think, I think, I completely agree with your analysis about Harris. Medea, I think she is, this has been her administration and she has not wavered from it an inch. Uh, however, I do think 
this is a, a real opportunity to put maximum amount of pressure on her in a very visible way and say, we are demanding that you and the DNC take certain positions, change direction, take a new path, move into something new. She's always saying, we're not gonna go back. We're gonna do something new. Here's something new. Uh, immediate and permanent ceasefire, uh, good faith negotiations, um, stop the arms aid immediately, massive humanitarian aid or whatever your list is. But, and it could be just one thing, but I think that's part of conveying the content of the message. And you have a tremendous kind of blank canvas when you get there uh, to paint whatever words you want on it. And, uh, and it will be watched all over the world. There's no question. Um, so I don't have, I don't have particularly high hopes that this will change her mind, but we did learn something from, uh, even the response of Nixon in the, in the sixties and the seventies to massive demonstrations, which was, they said they didn't care. Nixon was always out of the country when the large anti-war demonstrations happened. And then we read later in the Pentagon papers and other revelations that he was hiding in a closet. And, <laughs> And we know that the that the strength of these actions did affect the course of policy. He wanted to bomb North Vietnam. And what stopped him? Massive mobilization and realizing that public opinion would not stand for it. So I think we were in a very strong position here. Yeah, I, 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 Danica, we're kind of taking this away from you because we're so interested in what each other is saying. Um, but I kind of look back and think about the Obama times and people didn't want uh, us to protest at the uh, convention when, um, you know, there was so much enthusiasm for Obama. And we felt that it was important to still be there with our messages of uh, end the wars, bring the war dollars home, get the U.S., uh, get money out of politics, all of these issues. Uh, and I feel similarly now with Kamala Harris that there is tremendous enthusiasm uh, in the Black community, in the um, Asian Pacific community, in the women's community, and people who just, you know, have a, a sigh of relief that it's not um, Biden and that perhaps we can stop Trump. Uh, but there has to be this voice that says, as you were saying, Eleanor, what is it that we're calling for? And as you say, Bill, what is it that we want the world to see? I mean, what we want the Democratic Party to see is that we will not support this uh, 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 candidate if she doesn't show herself to be different from the Biden administration and that the Biden administration has some months right now to do something to stop this. And yes, the toughest one is the issue about weapons because you know it's not just the APAC and the Israel lobby and all of that, it's a weapons industry too. And you know they wanna keep this flow of weapons going, but our major demand is stop the weapons. Now, when you're in Congress and you talk about stop the weapons, it's a non-starter for the vast majority. And they say to us, at least distinguish between offensive and defensive weapons, because we're not going to leave Israel uh, defenseless against Iran and all of its enemies in the region. So uh, I can guarantee that the uh, Harris policy is not going to be an end to weapons to Israel. Um, but we have to push for that and we have to push for this immediate and permanent ceasefire. And uh, the things that you said, Eleanor, are the things. The humanitarian aid has to flow in there freely and immediately. But um, as Bill is making clear, the world is watching. And I think that is so important because they have to see that there is massive opposition in the streets and inside the suites, that we will just not let this be yet another convention. And that's why I love the comparison to 68 and we'll let you take it away, Danica, again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just being part of the younger cohort, sort of getting the city ready for the protests on the DNC, it's like something that we are hyper aware of is, is 68 and it's something we've constantly been thinking about and talking about. So I'm interested to hear from you, Bill, about, you know, we've we've identified sort of this DNC as a leverage point, um, something to take advantage of, especially with sort of the internal political strife in the Democratic Party. 
um, and just changes generally. So, Bill, I guess what what was the North Star in 68? And like, do you guys think that you like what what are the what are the parallels that you're seeing now? And I guess for the people who are gonna be in the streets again, I know you're joining us. Um, what advice do you have? What do you what are your hopes for it? Well, first of all, I I, I um you should know that I'm not one of these old people who's nostalgic for a ship that already left the shore. I do not look back and say, oh, those were the good old days. I'm living now, I'm looking forward. Doesn't mean we don't understand and stir up some things from our past, but I think that there's way too much romanticization of the 60s, the so-called 60s, which is mostly marketing. I mean, nobody in December 31st, 1969, looked in their watch and said, oh God, it's almost over. Let's get out there. That that never happened. So people don't live by decades. It didn't happen like that. But I do think there are some important notions. And one is, I think of demonstrations like the one we're planning for Chicago now and like the one we did in Chicago in 68. I think we we have a responsibility to know what we're, what our North Star is and also to recognize that activism really can can best be understood in a pedagogical way. That is, did we teach and did we learn? If you think about Martin Luther King, the great iconic activist of the 50s and 60s, King was a public educator. That's what he did. He created conditions where we could see what was going on and we could see beyond our blind spots. What happened in 68 in Chicago was that we had, we had kind of two goals um, and I was an officer of Students for Democratic Society. We were trying very hard to mobilize lots and lots of people to come. It was surprisingly a relatively small demonstration. You may not know that because the mythology of it, I mean, I've never met anybody my age who didn't say they were there, but they couldn't have all been there because it was a pretty small demonstration. But there were two things we wanted to do. One is we wanted to bring a million people to Chicago. And on that, we failed miserably. The other thing we wanted to do is we wanted to have as our audience, not the political class, but kind of the biggest audience was the whole world is watching. But the smaller audience was people like the people who, the young people who were coming to the convention, hoping that a peace plank could be won or hoping that Eugene McCarthy could be, could get some votes. And we wanted to educate them. So I think we should always have as a goal, what are we teaching and what are we trying to learn? If we're teaching and learning, it's good. If we're just interested in either numbers or kind of how we looked on TV, we're missing the point. We're missing the boat completely. Thank you, Bill. And I know Eleanor and I had a conversation about, I think the anti-war movement as a whole in the Vietnam era and Eleanor, I like just I loved your thoughts on this, so I wanted to bring it up in the in in this discussion. But not just understanding the DNC as one single point of leverage and one single point of mass mobilization, but as a jumping off point. And we talked about you know what you wish had gone better in the Vietnam era and like what you wish the movement had accomplished. So I'm just wondering if you could share your thoughts on, you know, building sustainability in the movement and what do you think our opportunities are here this summer? That's a, that's a great question. I think that's always the challenge, right? We've now lived through, uh, even in the last few years, several rounds of incredible mass, more or less spontaneous uprisings. Um, including the Occupy movement, the movement for Black Lives, the Palestine movement, which has been, you know, was inconceivable even two years ago that there would be such a broad-based, uh, enthusiastic, committed support for the Palestinian people in op opposition to Israel, Israeli actions, uh, as turned out. And of course, it wasn't actually spontaneous because organizations like yours and and uh, Students for Justice in Palestine and JVP and others have been doing the hard work on the campuses, in the dorms, local demonstrations, marches, all that education work Bill was talking about. So I think part of the question is how do you sustain momentum 
and what do you want to take from a period of high momentum? And I think uh, if you can, you want to take organization. You want to take some forms of um, holding on to the, the level of unity that you have with, in your own group and with other groups, uh, trying to push it forward, keeping track of everybody, uh, building on it, reflecting on it afterwards, and and continue to celebrate the victories and to build on them. And I also think something that I think we were less successful with in the 1960s, 70s, was um, really reaching out and building alliances with other movements. And uh, today I'm thinking about the movement against climate change and the environmental movement. And I think this there's a moment here which is uh, actually the negotiations on climate change have really ground to a halt. These critical annual summit meetings on climate have absolutely stopped moving forward. And right now, I think one of the main reasons is that the role of the US in supporting Israel has polarized the world so dramatically that the main countries who should be negotiating for our survival on this planet are facing each other across battle lines. And I think the Biden administration has a lot of responsibility and the Democrats have a lot of responsibility for that worldview that pushes them in that way. And I, I don't see a lot of signs that we can hope for something different from Harris, but I do think uh, it's an opportunity for us to say a lot of lives hang in the balance here and these issues are interrelated and building across those movements as you do with uh, the feminism of Code Pink and other, you know, and the peace movement of Co that Code Pink is part of. Um, but I, I think it's also an opportunity to reach out to other parts of different movements. You know, I think, I think this is such an important point because if you think about what it takes to build the movement, not just an organization, not a campaign, but an actual irresistible social movement, it takes changing the narrative, a huge, change in the narrative of, of whatever issues we're talking about. But then it requires kind of connecting the issues. So Eleanor, I'd love you to say a word about war and warming or the, the question of the Pentagon as a fossil fuel burner or the question of what single thing could the Biden administration do? They get a lot of praise for in their environmental work. What's one single thing they could do to actually leap the world forward in terms of climate change. I will say I'm wearing my code green shirt today. <laughs> um, yeah, well, as you know, I think the most important thing that could be done to move the world for forward on climate is to stop the war in Gaza, the single most important thing, because of the ways it poisons the entire universe of global negotiation on, on the issue of climate. And it has really, which have, have really ground almost to a halt in terms of meaningful negotiations. Uh, and also, you know, what they call the, the boot print, uh, the carbon boot print of the military is enormous. You know, the US military is the largest consumer of fossil fuels in the world, just that one organization. And the climate impact of, of the war, of course, the human impact is the main thing we're focused on. But uh, the art carbon impact is enormous, and a lot of it comes from the uh, the, the flights of you know, the uh, you know the bombing raids and the import of uh, weapons for the United States. All these things really add up, and it's just a way to say, "Hey, you people who are worried about climate, come with us to Chicago, and let's put that you know put those feet on the ground too, and let's do this together because the issues are really really profoundly linked." Well, I, I just want to chime in here to say that I've been really disappointed um, that uh, there are so many uh, people and organizations in the climate movement that haven't jumped aboard. Mm -hmm. um, we were trying to get them on board about Ukraine because, you know, you talk about wars that could lead to a nuclear apocalypse. Well, there's one right there with the U.S. involved in this war with Russia. Uh, and yet we had the hardest time getting the environmentalists to come out and support a call just for a ceasefire negotiations. Uh, and 
um, when you look at the U.S. provocations against China right now, that is also devastating. Utterly devastating. Uh, absolutely. Yes. And uh, all of the maneuvering that the U.S. is doing militarily to surround China and threaten China um, is another area where the environmentalists should be right there with us saying this is unacceptable. And when you talk about negotiations, Eleanor, I mean, we need to cooperate with China, as you well know. Uh, and yet we were in a hearing yesterday where the uh, senators, as well as the uh, deputy secretary of state, uh, were talking about how horrible it is that China is at the table when there are negotiations happening about Ukraine, for example, that they shouldn't be allowed to be there. And China is now coming forth as not only a, a superpower, but also one involved in negotiating. They brought the different factions of the Palestinian groups together. Uh, they negotiated a, a, a deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran, which um, the U.S. has said, you know, how dare they kind of come into our area and try to make peace. Uh, and the Chinese are, have been very involved trying to come to a way to uh, bring uh, Russia and Ukraine to the peace talks. So um, I think that the U.S. push for wars in general, and then, of course, the massive, massive military budget. I mean, think of what we could do with just taking some hundreds of billions of dollars away from the Pentagon and putting it into the climate issue. And so these are issues why we need to be together as a, a movement of movements. And Danica, I have a question for you as someone who's been involved in these coalitions leading up to the DNC. How involved are the environmental groups in the upcoming protests? They're there. Um, I'm trying to think I'm, there's a few involved in the coalition. You know, I do think the Palestinian orgs have taken lead in planning the in facilitating the coalition, which I think is, is completely makes sense. And I anticipate I anticipated them being there in large numbers. But then when we were at the Republican convention and they weren't there, it felt kind of strange. And I started thinking it might be a little different for Chicago, too, just because, you know, the Republicans very obviously don't care about the climate um and i just expected the environmentalist groups to be there and so now that the contradiction isn't as stark as like a lot of the liberal environmentalist groups want to say i i i don't know how many of them will be there i hope they join us especially the more progressive ones that are a little bit more keyed in um and to be part of the coalition you know our main demand is palestine so if they don't agree with it they probably wouldn't have signed on to the coalition which is you know a little bit um encouraging and i'm wondering you know bill you were talking about who our audience is and it's not the people in the convention it's you know the people around the world but also trying to sort of at least at Code Pink, we've been trying to sharpen these contradictions a little bit. And it's especially re relevant for the DNC, because like I said, at the Republican convention, they don't they don't care about climate, they don't claim to. So we don't really have to draw that comparison there. But, you know, at the Democratic National Convention, there is that thing where they're posturing across so many different issues that they don't actually in practice do anything about. Um, so I'm wondering if this is a question for all three of you, um, and I do want to encourage again people to put questions in the Q&A section. If you have any, please do. We'll move into those shortly. But um, if you all had a similar experience dealing with this sort of cognitive dissonance in the Vietnam era, and if you were successful in drawing those contradictions or just any advice for now. Well, I, I don't know that I have any advice, but I will say that the that this is this is what movement building looks like. There are always comings together and coming apart, and it's not it's never smooth and it's never easy. And it certainly wasn't smooth and easy then. I mean, one of the things that was remarkable in the '68 convention is that when we went into it, the main energy of it was mostly young people, mostly students, mostly white people. And yet the civil rights movement was exploding all around us. And then in the third or fourth day, down Michigan Avenue comes a mule train with Reverend Abernathy leading the, the march. Here comes um, 
you know, the, the comedian um, Dick Gregory leading a march. And it felt so right and so important. But for a couple of days, we were a little freaked out that we were not going to be a unifying force, but we were going to be separate movements. And and those things, are, I think, are quite natural. The one thing I'd like to... I, I don't want either of you to be discouraged about the difficulties of building these coalitions. And the one thing I'd like to... I don't think we really disagree, but maybe a little, a little struggle around rhetoric. I don't think there's one perfect thing to do. And I don't think the proof of your commitment is being in the streets. I mean, I think you guys are masters of it. And I'm always right there because... I have a genetic flaw that makes me go into the street when anything is happening. I just automatically find myself in the street. But that's not true for everybody. And it's not the most important thing to do. When you think about a movement like the Civil Rights Movement or like the Anti-Vietnam War Movement, which was not as successful as, and we could talk about its failures because they were massive. But what, what I think is important is that one of my brothers was in the service, trying to organize a servicemen's union in a military base. One of my brothers joined the Democratic Party, trying to build a peace wing within it. You know, there were many things that people could do. Organizing, research, writing. Right now, I know high school teachers who are trying to get their whole student body researching Gaza, researching genocide, researching Israel. This is good work. This is important work. And if they're not in the streets, I'm not going to hate them for it. We don't hate anybody who doesn't come out in the streets, Bill. <laughs> I totally agree. And yet we need, do need some numbers. Of course. Uh, especially after the pathetic showing of opposition at the RNC. You know, it's interesting just this week, um, the the Sunrise Movement that I haven't seen in Congress in quite a long time just came out and did a terrific action at J.D. Vance's office. Uh, and I thought that was wonderful. Uh, I'm delighted when I see any movements coming out anywhere or any, any groups. Uh, and it's so important that we look for all of these avenues to make our voices heard. Let's Absolutely. remember that the biggest voice is money. And that is what is driving our system, whether it's big oil or big pharma or the weapons or these lobby groups like APAC, they are driving our system. And so, you know, if we are to be the people power, the people's voice has to be heard whether that's in the streets or any other means to get our voices heard. But let's not deny that being in the streets is a very important tool that we have and that we must utilize when there are opportunities like the DNC. And the DNC really is a unique opportunity uh, to do it. And uh, I just hope as many people who are listening, watching, um, will get enthused about coming to Chicago if they don't already have plans to do that. But your point about about the environmental groups, you know, feeling like, well, why go to the Republican convention? That could also be true for many other people because Trump's, I mean, the if your audience is the Republican political class, they've already said that what Netanyahu should do is, quote, finish the job. So we already know where they are. They're with the genocide unequivocally. And I think that's maybe one reason that people weren't there as much. But I think, you know, Danica, you referenced an insider outsider kind of approach. I think there are going to be delegates who are from the uncommitted in Michigan in Wisconsin. That's thrilling. I think some people from the squad will be advocating, and I think that will be thrilling. So that happened very much in 68, that there were people on the inside. And, and I mentioned, you know, that we failed to get millions of people, but what we succeeded in was showing the system for what it was. It was a militarized, militaristic response to protesters who simply wanted their voices to be heard to stop a genocide. And what did they do? They had a police riot. And so we showed the world that this is what American power rests on. I think that was a huge success. I would add that the other thing is that is they, they, uh, they arrested and indicted some of the major leaders who had brought that demonstration about. And they spent the next few years of their lives on trial, even though they Absolutely. were exonerated. Go ahead, Medea, sorry. 
Oh, no, I just wanted to respond to, to something that Bill said about, you know, maybe people didn't go to the RNC because they think it doesn't, it, it wouldn't have, have an impact. But as we saw, and Danica, you can attest to this, there was so much media desperate to cover protests. And they were national media and international media. And they kept calling us and we were kind of embarrassed because, you know, we were just a, a small group uh, walking around in the streets. And, you know, they were looking for something big. And if the environmental movement had been out there in large numbers, they would have gotten the same message that they sent to J.D. Vance in the halls of Congress. Right. They would have gotten it out to the world. And okay. so I think when you're asking why be out on the streets when you know that the Republicans aren't going to pay attention, well, the world is paying attention. And it was That's a amazing. terribly, terrible missed opportunity. I agree with you. And I think if you look at Project 2025 from an environmental or climate point of view, it's absolutely game over. It's absolutely deadly. And, and uh, you know, the first Trump administration tried to enact some of these things. They were too incompetent. They didn't understand what they were doing. But this this new crew has a whole plan. They have a scheme. They know how to work government. It's extremely, extremely frightening and dangerous and has to be opposed. And I, I just of that, I think one thing we should point out also is that Project 25, 25, people talk about it as a program for the second Trump administration. It's much deeper than that. It's a it's a organ it's a manifesto for organizing for decades to come. It's a vision of a society. And most important, and a lesson for us, is that they united 110 organizations to get this done. So they have a united front around a fascist program. We should do no less. We should have a united front around a liberatory program. And that's a great definition of what, what we're looking for, you know, coming out of the DNC, not the whole thing, of course, but a major step. And uh, Medea, I want to say uh, to you that I understand uh, the critique of the environmental and climate movements, and that uh, that's mainly where I spend my time, and I'm trying to move that ball, and I'd like love to keep talking to you guys about it, uh, especially with the DNC in mind. Uh, but I think there is, a, as you know, a very significant climate justice movement, and parts of it have been allied with the Palestinians, other parts have not, uh, and I'm not sure you know, it raises the whole question of what you were describing as the um, hegemonic U.S. view of its role in the world. And that is something that is deeply threatening to the climate agenda. But I'm not sure that most climate organizations understand it at that level. So there's a yeah, lot and of work. I, on and I do want to say that, you know, Code Pink has, we consider ourselves environmentalists and that we, our origins is uh, from a, a environmental a gathering in Ojai, California, where environmental women came together, and that was the birthing of Code Pink. So we definitely feel ourselves part of an environmental movement, but it's the organizations that can uh, that can mobilize uh, people in the environmental movement that have been, uh, some of them, uh, difficult to get on board with recognizing the uh, danger of militarism. And now we see the potential of nuclear war on three different regions right now, between the U.S. and China, between the U.S. and Russia, and between Israel and Iran, which is very close to having a nuclear weapon and would not be had, had uh, Trump not taken us out of the nuclear agreement and had Biden gotten us back into that agreement in day one, which he could have done by executive order. So it is a very dangerous world. And when we talk about the uh, existential threats to the world and recognize that it is climate and nuclear war, those two are so intertwined. Thank you, Medea and everyone. I think, so I have a couple questions that I, I think one will be good to end on, hopefully po positive to end on. Um, and then there's another one that I think we could talk about, but I, Bill, you mentioned talking about the failures of 68. Did you want to do that or was that just something you were throwing out there? Well, I mean, I, I would only say this, that, that again, the mythologizing of the so-called 60s makes it seem like we won. But the reality is that we won something very important. 
1965, something like 30% of Americans opposed the war, or maybe less. By 1968, a majority opposed the war, and a supermajority throughout the world opposed the Vietnam War. But we did not end the war in 68. A million people were dead, but the war ground on. And Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon expanded the war. So every week that the war went on, 6,000 Indo-Chinese people were murdered every week. And it went on for another eight years, seven years. So we, we can't claim a huge victory. We did, as Eleanor pointed out, Probably we were influential in stopping the bombing of the dikes. Probably we were influential in stopping the, the use of tactical nuclear weapons. But what, what we set out to do was to end a genocidal war, and we did not do that. So I think that that, on some large scale, I feel like, I don't feel like miserable in the sense that we did change a lot of consciousness. We learned a lot. We've grown a lot. It led to other things, but we didn't stop the war. And that was our minimum program. And I would say when I uh, talk with people at Columbia, for example, I was arrested in Columbia in 1968. So I spent a lot of time with people there and uh, other campuses. Now I recognize both the rage, the sense that you know, this you're engaging on the most important moral issue of the time, and also the tremendous sense of frustration uh, that no matter what we do, we cannot stop this, even though people all over the world see it as egregious and criminal uh, as it is. And um, I really I recognize that, and and it's it's important to say, uh, you know, we threw ourselves at it, and it went on for years more. And for all the reasons that you all have uh, uh, enumerated tonight, the, 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 the amount of money, the military industry, the, the capture of the Democratic Party by fossil fuel industries, all of those things are tremendously difficult forces to, to overturn and to move. And, um, but that's why something like the DNC is so important in the work that you do. But hats off to the encampments and hats off to creating spaces where real education went on. I mean, any university worth its salt would have said, wow, these encampments are doing what we should have been doing all along. Let's, <laughs> let's, em let's embrace them. Let's invest in them. And instead they called the cops. So they accomplished something, two things. One is they began to change the narrative. They began to learn and teach but they also showed what the university is at bottom. And when universities from New York to California called in the police on peaceful demonstrators who were simply having a, a, a long lasting teach in, that's an outrage and we should continue to be outraged at that. And I think a lot of that energy, Medea and Donica, a lot of that energy is coming to Chicago. Where's it gonna go? I mean, what outlet does it have? I think it'll be here. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, I want to point out we have uh, Jeff Jones in the Q&A portion. Hello, Jeff. Um, pointing out that um, uh, Chicago 68 also included Bobby Seale and the Panthers raising their issues. So we could do a whole nother hour on that. I know we focused a lot on Gaza. Um, so there's definitely so many other issues being covered in the March on the DNC in 2024 as well. So I include, I really encourage anyone, like even if Gaza isn't your main issue, there is going to be a huge movement of solidarity in Chicago in August. So um, we need you there, uh, whatever your main issue is, you know, we all are working towards the same goals and can't win without each other. Um, let, me so say, let me just say thank you, Jeff, um, for that correction. Cause I mentioned Abernathy and I mean, but I didn't mention Bobby Seale. Of course, as Eleanor said, this group was indicted and Bobby was one of them. And it, it was really the most egregious persecution of, of Bobby Seale. Um, so we have two questions I think we could take on before we wrap up today. One is something I've talked to Medea about before, and I have some thoughts on it as well. Um, so when talking about one is, is one big difference between 68 and 24 that American soldiers aren't coming back in body bags like they were um, in Vietnam. And if that's like a point of um, where people are showing up or not. What I, I'm I'm going to say something really quick, then I'll pass it to Medea or, or Bill or Eleanor. Uh, feel free to chime in. I think with Chicago, it's a little different. We have the largest Palestinian population in 
uh, the United States here. So it is sort of really yeah. personal to hear. Um, you know, we have uh, we have a neighborhood called Little Palestine in the south suburbs in Bridgeview, Illinois. Um, we have so, so many Palestinian community groups and community members here who have lost dozens and dozens of family members in Gaza. Um, and it is really personal. You know, we have friends here who uh, came here from Gaza. And um, so it is really deeply personal, at least in Chicago. And I think, you know, as um, this country does get more diverse and we have more immigrants and refugee populations, there is going to be that sort of intense solidarity, because it's not just that we have Palestinians here, it's that these are our neighbors, these are our friends, these are our community members that we know and love and care about. So therefore, we know and love and care about their families as much as we do ours. Um, so that's what I'll say to that, but I'll pass it to Medea if you want to, I know we've talked about this before. Yeah, I mean, it, it is important to say that there are some diaspora communities that are extremely conservative and have pushed for bad U.S. policies like the sanctions against Cuba and uh, the sanctions against Venezuela and other, and other countries. Um, but in the case of Palestine, it really is quite remarkable the huge impact that the Palestinian community in all of its own diversity has uh, on trying to change this policy. And it's interesting to note that 35% of the Arab American community voted for Trump in the last election. You know, there are a lot of conservatives in that community, but I think now uh, way up on their list uh, it, rather than the social issues or economic issues that might have moved them towards the Republican Party, uh, is this issue of of uh, Gaza and ironclad support for Israel. Now, there are some Arab Americans that are trying to push the Republican uh, 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 candidate, Trump. I don't think they're going to get anywhere on that, but they are trying uh, but the majority of people in the Palestinian community and the Arab American community um, seem to really be intent on trying to uh, de make demands from Kamala Harris and say, just don't assume uh, that because you're a fresh uh, face that you're going to get our votes. And I think um, this uh, Palestinian presence in Chicago is going to be so absolutely critical and I also expect that it's going to have an influence on the inside because there are delegates that came from the uncommitted movement. Yes. Um, we are going to see people on the inside calling for a change of US policy towards Palestine. And that's gonna be very exciting. In some ways, it's a bit more reminiscent of the Bernie campaign uh, where we had that kind of uh, disruption on the inside of people saying, you know, we'll go Bernie and the wars. Uh, and uh, I don't know the extent that we'll have that on the inside this time, but I think it is an opportunity for those of us who want to do this inside action, inside outside coordinating uh, to be very coordinated. And it's very important for them to hear the message on the inside as much as it is on the outside. Yeah, Mindy, I think that's really important. I'll just give one more shout out to Chicago. Not only do we have a, a huge and progressive Palestinian community, but we're the home of Palestine Legal, which is one of the really important organizations doing work. We're also, we've had some, some incredible civil disobedience actions as well as mass actions. But for me as a Chicagoan, one of the most hurtful was um, during St. Patrick's Day, we had a big demonstration where we hang, hung banners off the bridges over the Chicago River and the unity between the million Irish Americans who were in the streets and our little Palestinian demonstration was huge because the Irish instinctively understand that British imperialism sucks. And therefore we were able to kind of make some connections and do some real education. And I think we have to always remember that our goal is learning, our own learning and teaching. I think there's another oh, God, aspect, that, another one other aspect I'll just point out to the inside outside uh, strategy, which is um, it became clear in Biden's waning days that 
uh, who was who was who was the force? What was the force that could provide energy and impetus to a democratic victory? And that that force was largely young people, people of color, women, all of whom were very alienated by the end of his time. And so the people who are coming to Chicago in many ways are part of that force. And I think that uh, Harris better see that and she better recognize it, that this is who she's gonna be counting on. And it's not going to be there if she is not uh, responsive to people's demands and uh, at least open-minded. Come into my office and sit down and talk with me and explain it to me. That's what she should be saying to to you. So that's sort of where I'm headed next. I think I hope this answer will leave us on a positive note. Um, and it's a question of are you seeing activism working in a broad sense? I think where is it working Um and I think honestly, like a lot of people were just saying that Biden was forced to step away because he's old and can't talk or whatever. Um, but, you know, like he might have been losing Michigan before that even happened. And so I do think he was feeling the pressure. And I I do think that they're kind of discounting what we were able to accomplish over the last few months. But um, is it working? What, what, what are we seeing? And like, what are your hopes for the next couple months and the DNC? I think it's working and I think it's the only thing that ever does work, frankly. And the, the you know, the, the voices of masses of people mobilized in whatever form seems to be the only thing that moves the political needle in our favor. And I think the, the uprise among students on campuses has had an enormous effect, and that's measured by the ferocity of the resi- the reaction to them, um, and and their way they're portrayed in the press. But enormous, I think it'll have an enormous impact. And I think those young people are going to be in Chicago, and they're going to be they're going to be mad, and they're going to want some answers. Yeah, I think it's work. I think the activism is working, and I think we have to always say activism and organizing, because sometimes activism can become knee jerk and kind of its own self fulfilling whatever. I, you know, when I think of myself in, in you know, in my twenties and thirties, activism became fairly simple for me. Even beating being beaten up by the police was relatively routine. Much harder was knocking on doors of strangers and trying to explain to them why the war sucked and why they had oh, to be on the side. And, and, you know, I think that's Im- important that we, we have to talk to strangers. That's part of our responsibility as participatory democratic citizens. And I think we have to also be willing to take risks and be courageous. And that's why, to me, I mean, I admire Code Pink so much. I, I don't know how the hell Medea gets into every little nook and cranny she gets into, but somehow she's always there. Um, but I really think that in this period, you know, as horrendous as October 6th was, within 10 days, JVP and Students for Justice in Palestine were out there with their activism, with their organizing, with their fact sheets, with their education. And I think it's just extraordinary what they accomplished in just a few months. And I think we should all be part of that. And of course, Code Pink is very much in that and and very much leading that. So I appreciate you. So um, I'm excited to see what happens on the campuses when uh, school gets back in in September. I hope there are uh, new uprisings and perhaps different forms of it. Maybe it won't be encampments, but uh, I think it's going to be very exciting to see that. And I think the administrations uh, better be thinking about how they're going to react, which is not by calling in the police. Uh, and I think that um, we are changing the narrative. No longer do people in this country want to be supporting Israel militarily, which is quite extraordinary. Mm-hmm. I mean, massive numbers and opinion polls showing that they want a ceasefire. Uh, but even more than that, saying we don't want to keep supporting Israel's attacks in Gaza. And so that narrative is changing. And I think uh, in terms of uh, what other things that we're going to see, I think while uh, Congress people are in their home districts now. Uh, we're going to see a lot of activism pushing them 
uh, on their positions. And I think we've seen shifting positions in Congress because of that local activism. And um, I uh, just do wanna say that walking the halls, what I feel inspired by is that every day some young person runs out from an office and say, I can't tell you what office I work in, but we love you and we love what you're doing and we're with you all the way. So in terms of winning in the long term, young people get it. And uh, you, Danica, are a wonderful symbol of that. And we're so lucky to have you as a co-director of Code Pink. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so true. Love you, Danica. Love you, Medea. And love you, Eleanor. So thank excited. Thank you to all three of you for coming on. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. Um, I will say that uh, Bill does have a podcast called Under the Tree. Um, Bill, do you want to plug that at all to our listeners? Of course I do. Um, Under the Tree, a seminar on freedom. Um you can get it anywhere. And I have a book coming out in the fall called When Freedom is the Question, Abolition is the Answer. And I'll be on book tour in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania in September. And Eleanor and her partner, Jeff Jones, wrote a really amazing piece on Gaza and connecting the climate. So I really encourage everyone to look out. I can put a little, for anyone who RSVP'd, I'll send up a little wrap-up email with all these things. Uh, Medea, you have a book coming out or came out, right? Came out. <laughs> Congratulations. Give the title. The, the NATO, NATO one, because That's NATO right. just had its meeting here. And I think people really don't understand what a horrific force it is for a war around the world. And so it's called NATO, What You Need to Know. And it's a very easy read, a primer on I this. Not uh uh, defensive alliance, this offensive alliance. Much needed. Offensive in both senses, actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you to all three of you and thank you to everyone who tuned in. Please go to codepink.org forward slash events. You can find everything we're doing for the DNC. Um, it's our festivities start on August 12th. Actually, we have a comedy show at the Lincoln Lodge and a community gathering beforehand. I encourage you guys to go get your tickets to that. Uh, the Lincoln Lodge has been so helpful helping us paint our visuals there. Um, they're incredible. And uh, we'll start August 12th. You could find all the events on the Code Pink website. You can email me, Danica, at codepink.org with any questions. But I hope we will see you in Chicago for the DNC. Um, and for if you're coming out of town, remember Chicago is hot and humid. That was an issue in Milwaukee. Was, people were just so shocked by the heat. It is hot here. So please stay hydrated. Start hydrating now. Let's get ahead of the game. Um, and thank you all for tuning in and have a wonderful rest of your night. And thank you to our guests. Thank you, Danica. Thank you, Danica. You're wonderful. Thanks, Danica.